Hi, hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am that host of yours who wants to talk about all of the tiny intricacies of Greek mythology, confusing and otherwise. Liv. And well, obviously, today's episode is the perfect example of this. Or so was last week's. Like I said last week, I have been so completely obsessed with these characters and their story for literally ever. Like, long before I ever got into mythology for my degree, let alone the podcast. I've mentioned this bit of my life on the podcast many times now because these two these two characters are essentially my origin story, so I won't get to do it again, but I just really want to emphasize how uh, deeply obsessed with them that I am. Because, well, their story is fascinating and brief and lacking in detail compared to other stories of heroes and adventure, but the details that we have are just so intriguing, so open-ended. I just want to know more. Fortunately, though, as much as the origin of Cadmus and Harmonia and their story is lacking in all of these things, the stories we have for much of today's episode are much more detailed. Because, well, that necklace is cursed as all fuck. But we'll get there. Just a reminder that as you're listening to this, I will be in Greece, oh my god, visiting new places I've never seen before, gathering more tips and tricks for all of you that I hope to add to my website. You've all asked for tips on Greece so often, which is why I bring this up. And for now, I do have a page on my site about what to see in Athens and Delphi. It's mythsbaby.com slash Greece. But I'll be adding more and more of the places that I visit now. Uh, you can follow along on this incredible experience via my Instagram. As always, my handle is MythsBaby everywhere. But just a taste. I've only ever been to Athens, Delphi, Kea, and Crete in the past, which is why whenever people ask me for recommendations elsewhere, I'm kind of useless. I've just been fortunate enough to visit Athens a handful of times. But this time, I'm expanding my knowledge of modern Greece by so, so, so many locations. So I'll be able to provide you all with more information, and you'll be able to see sites from Athens, uh, Nafplio on the Argolid Peninsula of the Peloponnese, where I hope to visit ancient Mycenae and Tiryns, and maybe even Corinth and Epidaurus, <sighs> then Naxos and Paros, Mykonos and the little sacred island of Delos, Seraphos, and finally Samothrace. I promise I'm not trying to brag, I'm just really excited, and I know a lot of you are excited for me, and you want to see it. I really can't wait to share the ancient sites I'll be seeing for the first time. My heart is just so full thinking about it, and I hope you all will enjoy following along. I know it's not the same to live vicariously, but hey, it's something. I'll also be doing some Instagram lives and Q&As and whatever else comes to me while I'm over there. Maybe even try to record something if I sort out a portable microphone. Anyway, I'm clearly just too excited uh, as I record this, so I will stop now. Today is about Cadmus and fucking Harmonia, my heart and soul in two mythological characters. And that cursed as all fuck necklace. This is episode 168. That is one cursed necklace. The deadly dynasty of Cadmus and Harmonia. When Cadmus and Harmonia were married, their wedding was attended by all of the gods. So many gifts were bestowed upon the couple, though who gave what varies greatly by source. But one gift that always, always features is a necklace. Was it a gift from Hephaestus, or Zeus via Europa via Zeus again, or Athena, maybe? Was it from Aphrodite, Harmonia's own mother? It doesn't matter who gave Harmonia the necklace, but it's interesting to speculate. Who chose this gift for her? Was it meant to be cursed? Was it meant to cause ruin to generation upon generation of Thebans? Or did that all happen without the will of the gods attached? Is that even possible? 
like any good curse from Greek mythology, we don't have a real answer, but we do have a lot of dark and gory evidence. Once Cadmus and Harmonia were married, they went on to have five children. Aino, Semele, Agawe, Autonomy, and Polydorus. The curse begins with Semele. You've heard her story before in a few different forms, but let's look at it again from the perspective of that curse on the children of Cadmus and Harmonia, that curse of Harmonia's necklace. Semele was beautiful, that much is important, because that is what brings about her fate. At least, that's what Zeus would say. Zeus, you see, took a liking to poor Semele. We all know what that means. Zeus wanted her, and so Zeus had to have her. How Semele felt about it is basically irrelevant, though here we do sometimes find the suggestion of some kind of mutual affection in some sources, in whatever form that's possible, when one is a god and the entire relationship is based on lies and deception. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Semele is one of the very, very few women that Zeus appears to have actually worked for, to have actually tried to impress, to have maybe even cared about if we ignore how she felt about it, unfortunately. <laughs> Zeus and Semele weren't just together one time, but many times over a period of time. If we have to find nicer things to say about Zeus, there is this, at least. And Zeus wanted to impress Semele. He wanted her to love him. He wanted her to want him. That, too, is a consolation. But he wanted her to like him so badly that he promised her anything. The details of this story are unclear, at least when it comes to ancient Greek stories, so I'm going to keep it brief and use mostly Pseudo-Apollodorus. He's a late source, but he's got something for us. Eventually, I want to talk about her some more in a different context, but today, the curse. One way or another, either through deception of Hera or otherwise, Semele ends up asking Zeus to prove he is who he says he is to prove he is the god, Zeus, and to appear to her in the same form that he appears to his wife, Hera. And so, he does. Did he have to? No. Could he have just fucked off instead of giving in to this request that he knew was bad? Definitely. But he didn't. He appeared to Semele in the same form that he appeared to his wife, Hera, and when Semele saw him in his full and complete godly form, she dies. Semele dies, but she's already pregnant with their child, and Zeus, in all of his I don't even know what, decides that he will save the child, but not the mother, and he whisks Dionysus out of his mother and into his very own thigh, where he will continue to gestate. Now, the very ancient sources don't reference much of this at all. Instead, they focus simply on the fact that Dionysus is the child of Zeus and Semele, without ever going into detail as to the fate of Semele. At least, surviving sources, that is. In the end, what matters is that he is her child. He is half-mortal. But also that she is not alive when he later returns to Thebes as an adult. And so, Semele is the first victim of that cursed necklace. Kind of, for now, at least. But that story is for another time. Dionysus, meanwhile, is finally birthed by Zeus and is, according to some infuriatingly fragmentary references, eventually brought to his aunt, Aino, who cares for him as a baby. Aino, it seems, might get to a avoid the curse, maybe kind of because she cares for Dionysus, or she's part of it but still it ends well enough. I will do a deeper dive into her one day because she's more interesting than I'd realized, but ultimately, Aino ends up a goddess of the sea with the new name of Leucothea, that is, after she is forced to throw herself and her child off a cliff and into the sea in order to escape Hera's wrath. Again, more for another day, but cursed? Maybe? Still a goddess in the end, so less cursed? But of course, the curse really gained steam in the second generation. Cadmus and Harmonia's daughter, Agawe, has a son. A son named 
Pentheus. Oh, Pentheus. Pentheus, Pentheus, Pentheus. There's no need for me to rehash the details of his story for you now. That's why I strategically re-aired the two part of the back eye before starting this story of Cadmus and Harmonia. That and I'm off in Greece and struggled a bit to prepare quite so many episodes in advance. It was like 25 or something. Still, now you've been given a visceral reminder of Pentheus's tragic and gory fate. That he did not believe his cousin Dionysus's divinity, and both he and his mother Agave paid the price. Pentheus, through Dionysus's trickery, was ripped to shreds by his own mother before she came out of her divine madness holding her son's head in her hands. A head she thought was a lion that she had so proudly killed. And so we get the first real example of the breadth of the curse, and just how horrifically it can go. If Pentheus isn't the perfect example of the effects of the curse necklace, then I don't know who is. Oh, wait, I do. Pentheus was not the only cousin affected by that cursed as all fuck necklace of Harmonia. Nope. Nor is he, necessarily, the most famous. It's just that this other cousin isn't quite as linked to Thebes, and because of that, his story tends to fly just a tiny bit under the cursed necklace radar. Because, well, one of Cadmus and Harmonia's other daughters, Autonomy, had a son. A son named... Acteon. Ugh. Acteon. Of course, as I've told you before, and as you've likely gathered from it being one of the most famous stories of Artemis, Acteon was famously killed by his own hunting dogs after he was transformed into a stag while out hunting. But why was he transformed into a stag, exactly? That bit is a bit less clear, and I'm interested in it. Maybe it's as the most common interpretation of the story goes, that he was out hunting with his friends and his hunting dogs, that he wandered off by himself and came upon a scene. A scene of Artemis and her nymphs bathing in a pool. That he, with this view before him, crept a little closer and made a point of watching Artemis bathe. Watching Artemis naked. And that for this, he was punished by her with the transformation into a stag. Or maybe it wasn't so cut and dry. Maybe Acteon was more of a victim than this popular version would make him seem. Maybe he didn't see her naked at all. The first interpretation that's a bit more kind to Acteon is the simple adjustment that maybe when he came upon Artemis and her nymphs, it was entirely accidental. Maybe he saw her naked, immediately realized that this was absolutely not something he should be seeing, and so he looked away. There's a Hellenistic poet called Callimachus who writes of this in one of his hymns. Quote, How many burnt offerings shall the daughter of Cadmus burn in the days to come? How many Aristias, praying that they might see their only son, the young Acteon, blind? And yet he shall be companion of the chase to great Artemis. But him neither the chase nor comradeship in archery on the hills shall save in that hour, when, albeit unwillingly, he shall behold the beauteous bath of the goddess. Nay, his own dogs shall then devour their former lord, and his mother shall gather the bones of her son, ranging over all the thickets. Should we feel some kind of sympathy for Acteon, or is he purely to blame? I told this story in the very, very early days of the podcast, and I absolutely blamed him. I don't necessarily think that's wrong. It's certainly, like, in the sources as well. But I'm much more interested in the idea that maybe he just had bad luck, or maybe it was this family curse rearing its ugly head. I mean, either way, it can and should be linked back to the curse. But what if it also was an unfortunate accident, an example of a goddess overreacting? We know the Olympians are capable of that, man or woman. 
The story of Acteon was so famous and important in the ancient world that it also features in a lot of so-called like histories of the region, their version of histories. They give us even more insights into how some of the ancient Greeks understood his story. So Pausanias, a travel writer in Greece who had a penchant for mythologizing people, places, and things, tells us that the real story of Acteon has him actually trying to marry his aunt, Semele, and that on top of that he also saw Artemis bathing, that the goddess then had him wear a deer skin as like clothing so that his dogs would kill him, and that this is also linked to stopping him from marrying Semele, but then on top of all of that, Pausanias adds that actually he thinks that Acteon's dogs were just going to rip him to shreds regardless, and it was more about the dogs than anything else. Which, I mean, there's a lot going on there. Meanwhile, Diodorus Siculus, who was a historian of the 1st century BCE, tells another story. He says that Acteon was in fact a devotee of Artemis, which adds another fascinating layer, and maybe adds an interesting piece to Acteon's gender identity or sexuality, one can speculate. Still, in this case, he says that, quote, Presuming upon his dedication to Artemis of the first fruits of his hunting, he proposed to consummate the marriage with Artemis at the temple of the goddess, but according to others, it was because he represented himself as superior to Artemis in skill as a hunter. So, he tried to assault her, or he said he was a better hunter than her. But he was also working with her as a hunter. Diodor Siculus goes on to add that either way, no matter what, the goddess was right and justified in her anger and that Acteon deserved what he got. Hmm. Finally, our favorite TLDR of Greek myth, Pseudo Apollodorus, tells the gist of this story, that Acteon indeed saw Artemis bathing and that he was punished for this via transformation into a stag, that as a result, his hunting dogs ripped him to shreds. But he adds another layer onto the story, noting that after Acteon's death as a stag, his hunting dogs looked all over for their master, really distraught that he was missing, until finally they happened upon Chiron the centaur and his cave. Quote, when he was no more, they looked for their master with great howls and bays, coming in the course of their search to Chiron's cave. He made a likeness of Acteon, which assuaged their grief. So Chiron made a fake Acteon to make the dogs happy. Whatever the minutia of Acteon's story, whatever the reason for his death at the mouths of his own hunting dogs, we can be pretty sure of one thing. That cursed as all fuck necklace struck again. And well, I'm, I'm actually running out of uh, time here because I've got so much more to say, but oh, this family line. So before we look at the curse, how it did and did not affect the progenitors of it all, Cadmus and Harmonia, let me just remind you of another generation of family members that are part of this cursed line of Thebes. Jocasta, Oedipus, and their own children. Brothers who wage war against each other, those famed seven against Thebes. All stories I've told before, so maybe a re-listening to my episode on Euripides' Phenisai, the Phoenician women, is in order. Seriously. This is one cursed family. Just generation upon generation upon generation. What I find so fascinating about this family curse is that, for all we can see, it is specifically linked to this necklace, this item, and yet we have little to no inclusion of the necklace itself in the sources. It appears later in a Roman epic called the Thebiad, which I plan to cover soon, but that's very late 
In the other sources, it, it kind of gets forgotten. It's known to be cursed, but then it sort of disappears. It's just so different from the most famous cursed family in Greek myth, that of Agamemnon and his brood. The Tantalid curse that becomes the curse of the Pelopidae that becomes the curse on the house of Atreus. That curse is much more serious and linked to not only straight up cannibalism, but cannibalism of family members, of children. It makes much more sense than a necklace. And yet, yes, I'm much more obsessed with the necklace curse. But what of Cadmus and Harmonia? Where do they lie in their cursed familial line? That, in itself, is why I find them so fascinating. For all the curse was brought upon their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren, the couple themselves were barely cursed at all. Cadmus is known for his accomplishments, his search for Europa, his defeat of Ares' dragon. He is even credited mythologically with bringing the Phoenician alphabet to Greece, thus creating the basis for the Greek alphabet. Harmonia, meanwhile, remains this enigmatic goddess who lived her life as a mortal. She is the only, only goddess that I have ever come across who lived as a mortal and appeared to gain mortality herself, with no background or thought on it. She seems to have grown old with Cadmus to have lived alongside him as any other human. And why? We have no explanation why, no comment or note about why a goddess would and could live like this. And she isn't just any old divinity, not like a nymph or a minor deity by birth. Her god status is minor, sure, but her parents, her parents are Aphrodite and Ares. And yet, here she lived as a mortal for no discernible reason. I fucking love it. Why? It doesn't make any sense. On what we know of mythology based on every other story of the divine and their interactions with humanity, it just doesn't track. And that is what I find so interesting. But in the end, they didn't just live on like mortals or die like mortals. They did reach the point of old age together. And from there, once more, we have to look to many different sources for many different explanations. The most important thing about Cadmus and Harmonia's fate, and what makes them, yet again, unique in the realm of Greek mythology, is that, well, they end up as snakes. Yes, one way or another, Cadmus and Harmonia, at the end of their lives, are transformed into snakes, where they, we're to presume, live out their snaky lives in relative contentment. Why snakes, though? What warranted this? Was it a punishment or a gift? The most famous source for the fate of Cadmus and Harmonia is my beloved Euripides, in the even more beloved play, Bacchae. Cadmus features in the play, though not heavily. Still, he's the patriarch of the family that Dionysus is raging against, and the city that they feel has wronged them so badly. To Cadmus, Dionysus says, quote, now, Cadmus, hear what suffering fate appoints for you. You shall transmute your nature and become a serpent. Your wife Harmonia, whom her father Ares gave to you, a mortal, likewise shall assume the nature of beasts and live a snake. The oracle of Zeus foretells that you, at the head of a barbaric horde, shall with your wife drive forth a pair of heifers yoked, and with your countless army destroy many cities. But when they plunder Loxias's oracle, they shall find a miserable homecoming. However, Ares shall at last deliver both you and Harmonia, and grant you immortal life among the blessed gods. According to Bacchae, Cadmus and Harmonia will be transformed into snakes, but they will also feature into some otherwise mysterious war. This pronouncement of their fate seems to be linked to the treatment of Dionysus, given that's the plot of the entire play, though Dionysus isn't entirely clear why they will face all of this. And in the end, it isn't all a curse anyway. The location of the war and their ultimate fate, it seems, is meant to be Illyria, because that's where they end up in all the other sources. It's to the northwest of Greece, like in the modern Balkans. 
there, and we don't know why, they travel. Cadmus even seems to become king there for a time. They might even have another child there, a son named Illyris, adding on a myth to explain the name of the region. And they go to war against others in this region. Again, we have no idea why. But all of this takes place before, eventually, they're transformed into snakes. And maybe, as Dionysus says in the back eye, after they become snakes, Ares gifts his daughter and her husband with immortality. Meanwhile, Pseudo Apollodorus gives us a most succinct explanation for the fate of Cadmus and Harmonia. Quote, Cadmus, son of Agenor and Argiope, along with Harmonia, his wife, daughter of Aphrodite and Ares, after their children had been killed, were turned into snakes in the region of Illyria by the wrath of Mars, because Cadmus had slain the dragon, guardian of the fountain of Castalia. So once again, we get their transformations into snakes, this time due to Ares quite specifically, and he isn't saving them, he's the reason for their transformation, and, and it still isn't due to that cursed necklace. I mean, we could probably debate it, but it seems to me not. Instead, it's more it's quite specifically from the moment that Cadmus killed Ares's sacred serpent. Though Pseudo Apollodorus does weirdly name it as the guardian of the Castalian Spring, which is by Delphi and not Thebes, as the story goes, regardless, still, we don't have their fates tied to the necklace in the way the fate of their children and their families is. So, are they cursed at all, or is being transformed into snakes something else entirely? The questions around the fate of Cadmus and Harmonia and why and how they ended up as they did continue on, down through the sources. As is only right, it's Ovid who gives us the ro most romantic and beautiful version of their fate. In his case, they explicitly leave Thebes for Illyria due to the fate of their families after they'd watched as everything fell apart. As Semele died at the hands of Zeus after their godly son Dionysus had lain waste to the, his cousin Pentheus, after Agawe had killed her son, that same Pentheus, they'd watched that and so much more happen to their children and their grandchildren, and they couldn't take the heartbreak any longer. So they left Thebes. From there, Ovid tells us, and I'm going to quote a big chunk now because it's beautiful, quote, and now, worn by their woes and weight of years, the two were talking of their early times, the fortune of their house and their sad toils. And Cadmus said, Was that a sacred snake, my spear transfixed, when I had made my way from Sidon's walls and scattered on the soil the serpent's teeth, those seeds of magic power? If it is he the jealous gods avenge with wrath so surely aimed, I pray that I may be a snake and stretch along the ground. Even as he spoke he was a snake and stretched along the ground. Over his coarsened skin he felt scales form and bluish markings spot his blackened body. Prone upon his breast he fell, his legs were joined, and gradually they tapered to a long, smooth, pointed tail. He still had arms, the arms he had he stretched, and as his tears poured down still human cheeks, Come, darling wife, Harmonia, he cried, my poor, poor wife, touch me while something still is left of me, and take my hand while there's a hand to take, before the whole of me becomes a snake. More he had meant to say, but suddenly his tongue was split in two, words failed his will, and every time he struggled to protest, he hissed. That was the voice that nature left. Beating her naked breast, his wife cried out, Stay, Cadmus, stay. Throw off that monstrous shape. Cadmus, what now? Your feet, your shoulders, hands, where are they? And your color and your shape, and while I'm speaking everything... You gods, why don't you turn me, too, into a snake? He licked his poor wife's cheeks and glided down to her dear breasts as if familiar there and coiled, embracing round the neck he knew. 
All who were there, and courtiers were there, were terrified, but she caressed and stroked her crested dragon's long neck, and then, suddenly, there were two. Their coils entwined. They crawled for cover to a copse nearby, and still, what they once were, they keeping in mind, quiet snakes, that neither shun nor harm mankind, but ample solace for their altered shape they both found in their grandson Dionysus, conqueror of India, worshipped in the new-built shrines of Greece. Ugh, there are so many details and references when it comes to this fate of Cadmus and Harmonia. So many ancient mythographers, historians, and more talk about the event itself and art that was made of it. Like the couple themselves, it was famous and important, even if it doesn't accompany much in the way of detailed retellings. We just know they became snakes. This was their ultimate fate. Still, it never feels like a punishment to me. It feels like a gift. They watched their family crumble. They watched as that cursed necklace took their children one by one. They even witnessed as it destroyed the lives or mentalities of at least two of their grandchildren. What they missed was the further generations that were affected by that one cursed item. But they themselves weren't cursed, or rather the curse on them was to watch what happened to their family. Instead, in the end, it feels as though the gods, Harmonia's own family, relieved their suffering by turning them into these divine creatures. Snakes were very sacred and revered, and that's what they became. They remained together, but they no longer had to deal with the problems of their past. I just, I love them so much. They're so fascinating. And well, because I am me and I have seemingly devoted 14 years of my life to understanding these two very specific characters, I'm going to read a poem to close this episode. I've been obsessed with it for also 14 years. It isn't from the ancient world. It's an English poet from the 19th century, Matthew Arnold. But it is about Cadmus and Harmonia, and it's beautiful. Far, far from here, the Adriatic breaks in a warm bay, among the green Illyrian hills, and there, the sunshine in the happy glens is fair, and by the sea and in the breaks, the grass is cool, the seaside air buoyant and fresh, the mountain breeze more virginal and sweet than ours. And there they say two bright and aged snakes, who once were Cadmus and Harmonia, bask in the glens or on the warm sea shore, in the breathless quiet, after all their ills. Nor do they see their country, nor the place where the Sphinx lived among the frowning hills, nor the unhappy palace of their race, nor Thebes, nor the Ismenus any more. There those two live far in the Illyrian breaks. They had stayed long enough to see in Thebes the billow of calamity. Over their own dear children rolled, curse upon curse, pang upon pang. For years they sitting helpless in their home, a grey old man and woman yet of old. The gods had to their marriage come, and at the banquet all the muses sang. Therefore they did not end their days in sight of blood, but were wrapped far away to where the west wind plays, and murmurs of the Adriatic come, to those untrodden mountain lawns, and there, placed safely in changed forms, the pair wholly forget their first sad life and home, and all that Theban woe and stray forever through the glens, placid and dumb. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Can you tell how much I love it? Ugh. These two episodes were, honestly, mostly for me. Like I mentioned, I just really wanted to get back into the inspiration of these two characters and treat them the bit more like the podcast in an effort to understand them. I've been struggling to finish this novel for literally 14 years, mainly because I keep changing what I want it to be. But my goal is to have a version that I love, that I feel is right and perfect by the end of this year. So... Now I'm off to write it in Greece, and for a time specifically on Samothrace, because fuck it, you know? These characters are just so 
utterly fascinating to me. And honestly, mostly just me. They are not your typical mythological characters, they're not famous, and their story, as it remains, doesn't have the most excitement or drama. There are no wild monsters or detailed adventures. They're just fragments. And a very, very cursed family. But I love them so fucking desperately. So thank you for indulging me, for listening to me just ramble on about how much I love these two. They're just the best. And soon enough you'll read my novel of them because I can never ever let it go. And then maybe it'll all be worth it. Uh, fine. Uh, enough about that. Let's read another five-star review from one of you magnificent listeners. This one is from SSIWB in Great Britain. Favorite podcast. Love, love, love this podcast. Liv is an amazing narrator and adds so much depth to stories I'd only ever briefly heard about before. Thank you. I'm glad to know I do that. Perhaps too much depth sometimes, maybe? Hopefully not. Let's Talk About Myths TV is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos, to editing and research, and so much more. Adding more all the time. The best. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. We've got an intern this month, and as I've said before, and will again, unfortunately she hasn't started by the time I've had to record all these episodes for this month, but I am certain she's going to be immensely helpful. So thank you, Grace Roby. The podcast is hosted and monetized by ACAST. Follow me as I follow Cadmus and Harmonia through Greece, won't you? I'll be sharing so much on Instagram, along with live Q&As and more. My handle is MythsBaby. A final thank you to Cadmus and Harmonia for giving me this life, because they are 100% to thank for my current love and obsession with Greek mythology, and 100% why I am where I am, even if they're deeply mythological and uh, fragmentary at that. Thank you all for listening and being weirdos along with me. It means the whole world. If I'm thanking non-mythological people for where I am now, it's obviously you all. I am Liv and I fucking love this shit.